Hi folks, my name is Dakota Cohen and in this presentation we're going to be talking about organs, bones and fats. We're going to be going over traditional recipes and skills for how to create nutrient dense meals right in your own home. So for the, for the presentation outline, we're going to start off by talking about the three most prevalent myths about organs, bones and fats that uh, make people feel like they shouldn't eat them. Uh, namely, the, that animal foods are bad for our health, they're bad for the environment, and it's just unethical, it's, it's immoral to eat them. So I'm gonna be going through each of those kind of myths and give, give you guys permission, because I really believe that, that people uh, want to eat these, animal, these, these incredibly nutrient-dense animal foods. And, uh, but there's these kind of these three myths that, that make us feel like we, we can't do that. We're also going to be going over skills, uh, the basic skills for how to cook with organs, how to cook with uh, bone broth, and how to render fat, things like that. And at the end of the presentation, I'm going to go through three of my favorite recipes from uh, my recipe book and uh, show you some pictures and, and just give you some tips and tricks about how you can uh, start making those in your, own, in your own kitchen. Okay, starting off with, but aren't animal foods bad for our health? Why are you doing a presentation about organs, bones, and fats? This stuff has been you know, debunked for, for the last 100 years. Our, all of our health experts have told us that, that, that we shouldn't be eating these things. So <clears throat> to, uh, to start off with, I want to uh, give you guys a little bit of a riddle, which is uh, what is the most common disease in the world? So you'd be surprised to know that uh, uh, you know these 10 or so diseases up here uh, are, are actually not the most common disease. Things like autism that, that right now uh, in, in the United States, this is information that I got from uh, Dr. Zach Bush, who's a triple board certified doctor in the United States. Uh, autism is one in 36, asthma is one in 10, uh, attention deficit disorder, one in eight, allergies, 25% of the population, diabetes, 25%. Infertility is one in three in males, and in females, it's, it's 25%. Major depression is expected to affect at least 50% of the population at, at one point in their, in their life. Cancer is the same thing. And interestingly enough, according to Dr. Bush, uh, some of the, the studies that, uh, that were done on uh, the testing kind of early onset signs for dementia, where they, they were basically doing brain tissue um, research to look for some of those early indicators, they found that everyone that they tested in their studies, regardless of age, right from children all the way up to adults and, uh, and, and the elderly, everyone they looked at was, showed some signs of, of brain degeneration, like 100%. But that one is, is you know, kind of, it's a bit controversial. And so the most common disease in the world, actually, I, I guarantee you have it, is this, it is uh, dental cavities. So according to the World Health Organization, about 60 to 90% of school age children have uh, cavities, one or more cavities. And according to them, 100% or almost 100% of adults worldwide have or will have at least some form of, of tooth decay in their lifetime. Now that is absolutely insane because when when I when I first realized this uh, through my research is that this isn't just you know a, a, a normal thing. This is this is literally a disease. It's 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 considered a physical degeneration, and it's caused by malnutrition. Now the interesting thing is. You know, if, if um, whenever I ask this question in my live presentations, the, everybody, everybody either sticks up their hand that they've, that they've ever had cavities or that they've had the second problem, which is braces. So I've actually had both of these uh, and most of the, the kids in my family have had both of them as well. We're going to get into the, the connection between how uh, the, the connection between cavities and braces and how they're actually both uh, two, so, two sides of the same coin. So in the 1930s, there was a dentist by the name of Dr. Weston A. Price. And uh, 
he started to notice that his patients that were coming into his dental practice were, were having a lot of tooth decay. And it was his hunch that there was some connection between the, the, the diet of the day. Uh, you know, this is in the 1930s, this was just on the edge of, of you know, like modern foods and, and, and um, a lot of changes in the American diet. And so he, uh, he came up with this hypothesis. By the way, yeah, he's a, a very well-known uh, dentist. He actually, he actually wrote the book uh, for uh, the U.S. Navy about uh, dental health. And he, <clears throat> he, he, he came up with this hypothesis that there was a connection between the, the, the quality of the food that his, his patients were eating and their dental health. And he also thought there was a connection between, and that was just for their cavities, but he, he started to notice that, that there was a connection between the, the, the overall health of the, um, their, not just the, their dental health, but their overall health. Even to the point that he started to notice that there were signs that the, that his, that the parents that were coming into his, his office that had really, really bad dental health, their children seemed to have worse teeth there seemed to be a correlation there, but he wasn't sure about how to how to prove this uh, in, in, a, in a scientific way. Um, and actually, the, his his hypothesis was that the, the it was increasing amounts of animal foods that were causing these problems. So, what happened was uh, uh, someone in his family happened to work for the National Geographic, uh, which at that time was you know pioneering the the world and starting to kind of open up borders into uh, so folks could see what traditional peoples were, were living like all around the world. Everyone's seen, you know, the, the you know, naked women in, in, uh, in Africa. It was, it was a very novel thing. But to, uh, to Dr. Weston A. Price, he wasn't so much fixated on the, the naked women. What, what he couldn't get over was, was how all these traditional cultures that were from all over the world, how amazing their teeth were. And one of the, the comments that, that uh, came out was that, that they have teeth as white and straight as piano keys. And so it was through this chance encounter with, with uh, his, his nephew's work at the National Geographic that he realized that the way to test his hypothesis is as to whether or not there was a connection between the, the kinds of, of food that people were eating and how, the, how that was affecting their dental health, he realized that he could basically do controlled studies with these indigenous populations who had been eating the same foods for thousands of years uh, in complete isolation from the modern world. And so what he did is over the course of 10 years, him and his wife traveled to every inhabited continent and they studied 14 different tribes. Uh, and they did this to try to answer two questions. First off, were these reports true? You know, were, were these... Uh, were the, the amazing, you know, pictures of how straight and white their teeth uh, that were coming back through various um, news channels, were they, were they accurate? Uh, or was it just, you know, some trick of the camera? And secondly, what were they eating? And, and was there a correlation there? So one of the places he visited was Australia. And these are pictures that he actually, him and his wife took themselves. And their process for, uh, for doing this research was very scientific. They would come into a village, they would, they would approach the elders of the community, and they would request to look at every single man, woman, and child, young and old, in the village, and they would go through their teeth meticulously and count cavities, and also note other dental imperfections and things like that. <clears throat> and they did this in Australia, um, and it ran right around the world. But the amazing thing is that they didn't just do it in the, the you know, healthy, healthy uh, tribes. They also tried to find people that were living nearby that had just moved into uh, you know, a nearby city that had you know, access to the same kinds of foods that were being eaten in North America at that time. And what he found was absolutely astonishing is that uh, there was, you know, tooth decay that he had not seen in, in his practice, as you can see in these pictures. And <clears throat> we found was the same pattern happened over and over and over again. The, the peoples that were eating their traditional foods had these amazing straight, white, wide mouths, uh, no dental cavities, um, very 
uh, very few dental abnormalities. Uh, for example, this, this woman here was in her 90s when this picture was taken. You can just look how, how beautiful she is and how healthy she looks. But when, when he looked at the same uh, genetics, because he was trying to rule out, you know, was that, was that part of the, the factors? Were these traditional people just more healthy because of, of something in, their, in their, uh, their genetics? He ruled that out by studying the same time, often the same, like, like the same relatives. You know, the, the one niece would stay in the traditional village and, and raise a family. The other one would go to, to town. And, um, and he'd be able to study both these people and, and, and count cavities in both these communities and find that, that genetics was not playing a role. So uh, you can start to see that the, the, the first generations that made the switch off of their traditional foods and onto the, the modern foods, which tended to be high in you know, processed foods, white, white refined sugars, white refined flours, vegetable oils, canned foods, uh, things like that. He also studied this uh, various various peoples in in Europe, the um, people like the Swiss, Swiss as well as uh, um, some folks that lived out on on islands. They ate mostly fish and things like that. And this is where the story gets really interesting, is because not only did he find that there was a connection between you know the the health of the foods and the health of their 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 teeth. But he started to notice that there was a correlation or a, a transference to the second generation who had been on uh, these new, new modern foods where they started to have not only tooth cavities, but actually tooth deformities, crooked teeth, uh, cleft palates, problems with their wisdom teeth, all these different things. And so the, the first generation, all their teeth would fall out. And, this, and, this, and if those people had children, their children started to have physical deformities. This is uh, another tribe that he visited in North America, seven only indigenous. Again, you can see it, you know, traditional foods, straight white teeth, wide mouths, wide nostrils, almost a square looking face. And then the, the second generation, the, the children who were born to parents who were eating these modern foods, they started to have for the first time ever, these you know, crooked teeth and a long, uh, narrow face. He also went out to the far north. What's interesting here is that uh, you, you can kind of see it on this, this picture here. This man had extreme uh, tooth wear because one of the practices that the indigenous of, of the, the north uh, would do to make, their, to make their leather clothes nice and soft is that the men particularly would chew on them to, to make the leather soft and supple. But what would happen is that the, the leather would often become impregnated with grains of sand. So they were essentially chewing on sandpaper. They would literally wear their teeth down almost to the gums. But what was fascinating is that even in that, that state of extreme uh, wear, there was still, in, in a lot of the men, there was very few cavities and, and very few problems with their teeth. And he saw the same problem there. Traditional folks had healthy straight teeth, even though they, in this, this particular case, they were quite worn. The first generation of the folks that, that were the same genetics, uh, often relatives of the people that were living in the traditionals, in the traditional villages, eating the, the, the traditional foods, when they would move to a modern city, they would start you know, drinking alcohol and sugars and white breads and processed grains and canned foods. They started to have terrible, terrible tooth decay. And when they had children, their teeth were physically deformed um, as well. Africa was another place that he visited. And according to his records, uh, he felt that, that the, um, this particular tribe uh, was, um, was one of the healthiest peoples that he had studied of all the 14 different tribes. And of course, the, the same problem happened there when they moved to the, to the villages and switched their diets. They started to have uh, terrible tooth decay and then their children started to have these elongated faces um, that were you know, long and narrow and actually started to jut out. And there was, you could start to see an actual indentation in the, the middle third of the, the face, which we'll get into a little bit later. So this picture really, uh, shows the, the difference in the facial structure of, of the, the traditional diets versus the, the second generation diets 
on these uh, these new modern foods. <clears throat> Okay, so now the big question is, first off, the reports were true. They had answered the first question that people that were eating these traditional diets were incredibly healthy, not just in terms of their, their teeth, they were living to you know, old age and, and uh, they were just very, very vital. There's stories of you know, young children playing in glacier fed mountain streams, you know, buck naked in the middle of the winter and they were with no clothes on and they were, they were totally healthy. Uh, when, when him and his wife had to be bundled up in, in, uh, in, in their furs and wool coats. So the, the second question is, well, what were they eating? Well, the, to no surprise, they was, there was a huge variation in the kinds of foods that they're eating. Some of these people had no plant foods. Some of them had few animal foods. Some of them had mostly cooked foods. Some had a large amount of raw food. Some had milk, some didn't. Some had grains, some didn't. Some had fruits, some didn't. <clears throat> but what he noticed was when he, when he when after he got back and he started compiling all of his research, he started to notice there were certain patterns that were starting to emerge from, from the data. And what he found was that of all the, the 14 tribes that he studied, uh, all of them followed uh, 11 principles. And these 11 principles uh, uh, were things like they all ate animal fats and proteins. They all ate animal bones and organs. They all had sacred foods for parents or uh, for different demographic groups. So parents had, had certain foods that were sacred to them. Babies had certain foods that only babies got to eat. Growing young children, growing children, teenagers, um, people that were about to get pregnant, people that were pregnant. Every single demographic in the community had foods that were that were uh, specific to those and, and they were often sacred. They were rituals. Um, and uh, a lot of respect around these foods. Uh, what was really surprising is that 30 to 80 percent of the fat content was, uh, uh, or from the 30, 30 to 80 percent of the calories came from fat content in the diets of all these different traditional peoples, wherever they were on the planet. They also all had some kind of a high food enzyme product, so something that was basically fermented, things like sauerkraut, you know. Uh, fermented milks, fermented grains, uh, beers, uh, sauces, kombucha, things like that. There was, there was something that, that, um, that uh, they ate with a lot of their foods that, uh, um, that the people, you know, there was, there was pairings where, where only certain foods were eaten, eaten together uh, and very deliberately. <clears throat> There's also a, uh, an almost equal amount of omega-3 uh, to 6 fatty acids. And so, uh, the, what happens was, was when these, uh, the omega-3 to 6 ratios get out of balance is that it tends to cause a lot of inflammation in the body. But when they're close to one-to-one, to one, um, there, there doesn't tend to be a lot of that problem. <clears throat> they also all tend to have a lot of uh, raw or some kind of raw animal products, whether it was raw milk or raw meat or raw insects or raw, um, raw fish or something like that. They all had some kind of, a, or even raw blood. <clears throat> and <clears throat> the, uh, the eighth principle was that when he brought these foods back to his lab in North America, he was able to test the nutrient density of foods that were being grown in these traditional villages uh, and compare those to the same kinds of foods that were being grown in, on North American farms. Uh, things like you know, oats or rye or milk uh, or certain vegetables. And what he found was that when he tested the same foods that were grown you know, in, in traditional agricultural villages versus the foods that were grown on you know, the modern uh, and industrializing farms in the United States, he found that there was four to 10 times the amount of minerals and fat soluble vitamins, things like calcium, vitamin K2, AAD, stuff like that. The ninth principle is that, that, that any culture that ate seeds, grains, and nuts all soaked, sprouted, or fermented them, uh, sometimes several combinations of those before they ate them. So, you know, the Seminole Indians, they would, uh, uh, you know, mash up their corn and ferment it with, um, with lye. The, the Swiss folks would ferment rye bread for, for up to two weeks before they would eat it. <clears throat> and, uh, uh, you know, a lot of the, the, uh, indigenous folks of of, uh, of Africa 
had very elaborate ways of, of making beers and, and, you know, fermented beverages out of the, the legumes and things there. <clears throat> the 10th principle was that they all uh, had some source of, of salt, whether that was coming from the food directly, like things like blood or eating the gallbladder uh, or uh, some other part of the animal that, that happened to be high in salt, or if they were actually, you know, mining or uh, dehydrating salt from the ocean or finding a, a salt spring somewhere. Uh, but salt tended to be a very sacred food, particularly for, you know, the, the storage and processing of, of foods as well. And the 11th principle was that uh, there was no refined or denatured foods uh, in, in their diets whatsoever. So beyond fermentation and cooking, there was no other form of, of uh, processing that these foods were undergoing. So they were, they were as close to natural as possible. <clears throat> and so what is, what is really interesting is that when you look at um, you know, those foods, uh, you can see how, how few of these uh, principles are, uh, are followed today. I mean, we're, we're, we're told by our medical experts, don't eat animal fats and proteins. Don't eat animal, don't eat animal organs. They're dangerous. They're, they could be toxic. Um, you know, there's, there, there's a little bit of sacred foods for our, our, our babies. Um, you know, the special foods is basically just the same foods that we eat. It's just blended up. But other than that, everybody eats the same, the same things, regardless of, of their age. Uh, we're told to be terrified of fat. And, um, and uh, you know, th there's very few high food enzyme products anymore, apart from beer, which a lot of the beer actually is pasteurized. Our ketchups, our sauerkrauts, uh, things that were traditionally fermented are now actually pasteurized and canned, pickles, stuff like that. Uh, when we start doing testing on the omega-6 omega to, to 3 fatty acids, we find that they're way out of whack. Uh, we've actually had our own grass-fed beef and eggs and pork tested on, on our farm for the omega-3 to 6 ratio, and they're almost one-to-one -one versus you compare that to you know, animals that are raised on factory farms, and they can be as high as 40 to 1, uh, you know, 40 times the, the amount of, of um, uh, inflammatory omega fatty acids. Uh, raw animal products are are just they would be outrageous to and in some cases illegal to to sell or consume any of these these raw animal products and uh, in terms of you know the mineral and vitamins in our foods we're there's no really talk about that anymore we're just told to you know take vitamins and, and minerals and things like that and of course our seeds and grains are you know, rarely sprouted anymore uh, salt we're told to fear salt like uh, like it's the plague and um, I minimize it and even a lot of the salt that we're eating is, is highly refined so a lot of the minerals have been taken out of it and it's just pure uh, NACL and of course our diets are filled with non-refined uh, with, with refined and denatured foods so you know <clears throat> what is uh, what's interesting is that uh, uh, you know it is it really such a shock that, uh, you know, given the, the, the patterns that he was seeing in the 1930s, why we're seeing so many uh, dental cavities, 60 to 90% of school aged children, 100% of adults uh, with some form of cavity and the huge, you know, booming industry right now in, uh, in, you know, braces and, and things like that. And so if we actually go through, you can access this, uh, this chart if you'd like to take a closer look at it from the Price Pottinger Foundation, uh, which shows all the different 14 tribes in the comparison between the, uh, the traditional, which is in the white, and the uh, uh, modernized foods and what they were eating, but also the percentage of cavities in the population. So in some of these, some of these tribes, they were going from almost 0% to, you know, 6 uh, six or seven, 40%, 70%. Um, uh, you know, they were, all of them were, were a 10, 20, 30, 100 times or more increase in the number of cavities from the traditional to the, the modern types, type foods, which is just absolutely outstanding. So we're, we're going to get into um, some of the, the research that he, that he Dr. Weston A. Price, was able to do into those foods and why this is happening and also what we can 
do, what we can do about it to, to help you know, reclaim our health. But before we do that, I just want to talk about another fellow who, as you can see, uh, you know, from the Price Potter Foundation. Um, uh, so Dr. Price is obviously the price portion of that. And uh, Dr. Pottinger is the other side. So Dr. Pottinger was, was another doctor uh, around the same time who was specializing uh, in uh, treating of tuberculosis, asthma, and other lung-related diseases. And he, by accident, uh, started to do research on uh, cats that he, that he didn't mean to. So he, he was actually using these cats in his studies for these lung diseases. But if anybody who's ever had cats, uh, you know that uh, once you've got you know, one or two cats, you've got you know, hundreds of cats. Because first off, those two cats start to breed and very, very rapidly, you start to have, you know, they start to have babies. But also when other people see how many cats you have, they think, oh, wow, this person really likes cats. I'm going to give them all of my cats. And they just drop boxes of cats off on your door. And this is exactly what happened with uh, Dr. Pottinger, is that, you know, on his, in his lab, he had a special area that, that he, he kept all of his cats in and fed them very special diets of um, uh, typically uh, two-thirds raw meat, one-third raw milk, and cod liver oil. And, um, and it was, that was a very controlled diet so that he could you know, rule out any changes in diet in the, the other studies that he was doing. But at a certain point, he started to have hundreds of cats uh, at his, faci his facility. And because people kept dropping off cats, they were breeding. And at one point, he ran out of the food that he was eating, feeding these cats. And he was forced to go to uh, a nearby butcher shop to get more, more of the, the, the raw meat. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the, the butcher shop was totally out of raw meat. And so they, but they said, you know, we, we've got some, some of this new product. It's cooked meat. And, you know, you can have some of that. So he said, sure. He took it back to his lab. And, you know, the, the cats that he was doing his, his studies on, he, was, he kept feeding those the same diet of raw, raw meat, raw milk, and raw cod liver oil. And the other cats that were just kind of, he was uh, basically, you know, being, being kind to and, and uh, trying to give them a good home. He fed them kind of whatever he had laying around, which, which was this, this cooked meat um, along with the raw milk and the raw cod liver oil. And something very interesting happened is that within a very short period of time, he started to notice a difference in these two groups of cats. That was, that was outside of, of his original study. And he actually shifted his focus and started doing a lot more studies on, on this. And he kind of left the, the lung disease stuff aside. What he found was that in the first generation that, was, that were uh, on this new diet of the, the cooked meat, he found that in the first generation, they started to be, become lazy and develop you know, similar degenerative diseases to humans late, late in life. So things like you know, arthritis, bad teeth, uh, receding gum lines, stuff like that. But when those cats started to have babies, so the, the cats that were eating this, this cooked meat uh, and the raw milk and raw cod liver oil, when they started to have babies together, those babies, they were the second generation, they started to, have, to become lazy and develop degenerative diseases in midlife as opposed to the late in life. And they start to be a loss of coordination. You can actually look up videos of this online uh, where they show some of the, the tests that they did, which were probably not, uh, would not be allowed to, to go on today because of, of uh, the um, unethical nature of it. But there's a saying that, you know, cats always land on their feet, you know, no matter which way you throw them. Well, that was one of the tests that he used to, to, to show track the coordination of these cats is he would basically spin them in the air a few feet off the ground, you know, a number of times, and he would count the number of times they landed on their feet because that was a metric for coordination. And what he found was that the, the second generation was starting to show uh, signs of, of a loss of coordination compared to the control group, which was still being fed the raw milk, raw meat, and the raw cod liver oil. Now, when that second generation started to have babies together, and that became the third generation, they started to become lazy and develop degenerative diseases early in life, and they started to have a shortened lifespan altogether. <clears throat> they also started to notice that the, the kittens that were born were uh, uh, blind, 
Uh, a lot of them were blind. They, um, there's also a difficulty in, in conceiving babies. So there's low fertility. The cats also started to have increased uh, allergies and, and they even started to have physiological changes. So the shapes of their skulls started to change, the size of their teeth, the density of their bones. And what was even more interesting is that there was personality changes. So the male cats started to become more like females and the females started to become more like males. So the males became really docile and, and non-aggressive and the, the females were the opposite. And by the fourth generation, so when those third generation cats started to have babies, there was 100% mortality of the offspring within six months. So the question is, what was missing from their diet? Because that was the only variable that these cats were facing. And what happened to be missing was a single amino acid called taurine, which happens to be denatured or destroyed when meat is cooked. And so all modern cat food that comes in a little bag now has this, this enzyme added into the, the cooked food. So it doesn't, because it, if it's not cooked, it goes bad. Um, and so, but it's very simple, easy to fix, but they didn't know this in the 1930s. And so that was the only variable that was missing from the, for the foods was, was a single amino acid. And so when we look at the 11 principles of these traditional diets and all the different things they were eating and all the things that we're told not to eat today, uh, specifically, which again, the, the amazing thing is that the first seven of these principles all relate to animal foods of some kind. So over half of the, the, the principles of, of these traditional, of these traditional uh, peoples were related to animal organs, bones, and fats. And yet we're told not to eat those today. So is it, is it any wonder why all the things that, that are missing from our diets today and, and the incredible changes that happened with a single ingredient missing in their diets, is it any wonder why we're facing the incredible disease epidemic where 60% you know, of, of um, deaths worldwide are from degenerative diseases? <clears throat> so the question is, how many more generations can we last? You know, cats breed a lot faster than we do. It can be a couple months uh, from the time a, a kitten is born until it can be uh, bred, and, and that's one generation. For humans, that generation is about 20 years. And so when we look at you know, the 1930s, which is when Weston A. Price started to do his research, and that was basically the first generation um, that were eating these, these new foods, that were obviously missing some kind of nutrient. Uh, you know, we can count 20, uh, 20, 40, 60 years. And right now we are in the midst of the fourth generation. So what are we seeing? We're seeing, you know, increased allergies, increased degenerative diseases, shortened lifespan. We're starting to see um, incredible infertility rates in, uh, in males and females. The same things that were happening to those cats. So this really comes to why organs, bones, and fats, and, and relating this back to the, the missing ingredients is that there are certain nutrients that are only found in animal products. Now, the very first one, vitamin A, is, and, and actually a lot of the other ones are very controversial, and I don't have time to get into the science of, of all this stuff. Um, I'm gonna encourage you guys to go and do, do some research of your, of your own about this. But there's an incredible amount of misinformation about which nutrients are found in foods and which aren't. Uh, and there's certain uh, vitamins that are precursors to vitamins and, and they might be found in, in, in non-animal uh, foods that our bodies have the ability to convert into the, the true form of vitamin A, things like beta carotene. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, they're not the same and they, they cause, they, they, for example, in vitamin A, they require other nutrients for our bodies to be able to manufacture them. And um, according to you know, doctors that work with the Weston A. Price, uh, the young children do not have that ability. So it's only in adults and only in adults that are super healthy and only in emergency situations can our bodies convert some of these nutrients. But other things like you know, vitamin B12, cholesterol, fatty acids, they're only found in animal foods. And there's other nutrients that are also found in, in you know, plants, uh, foods, but they are more easily assimilable, assimilatable in our, into our bodies when they're found in animal products, things like calcium, vitamin B6, magnesium, iron, zinc, copper. 
And so this is a really simple analogy to think about vitamins and minerals is that the minerals are like bricks and the, the vitamins are like the mortar that holds them together. <clears throat> and so imagine your body as a, as a building made out of bricks. And, and this is, this is uh, a, an excellent analogy because it's, it's literally true. Every cell, bone, organ, tissue in our body is made out of vitamins and minerals. Now, <clears throat> just like in a building, uh, you, you have, once it's built, that's one thing, but you also have to maintain it. You have to, you have to paint the walls. You have to, you have to repair the brickwork. You have to reshingle it. You have to make sure that, you know, the, the windows are stained and that, and that your, your, your decking is looked after. You need ongoing materials to make sure that the house doesn't degenerate. <clears throat> and so, um, now the other interesting thing is that, that, uh, the enzymes here, which is one of the principles, all these traditional cultures had some kind of an enzyme. What do enzymes do? They're catalysts. They, they help create uh, efficient reactions between other things. And so you can think of those like power tools. So you've got, you know, your vitamins, minerals are your bricks and your mortar, uh, are your mortar and your bricks. And then, it, and these enzymes are like the power tools that help us build even faster and more efficiently. So what happens when our, our bodies are being built, um, literally in our, in our mother's womb, the, the, our mother is, is eating foods and uh, getting, extracting vitamins and minerals and enzymes from those foods that are being used to, to literally build our body. And one of the first bones, for whatever reason, that starts to become affected when there's a shortage of materials, because just like when you're building a house, if you don't have enough materials, if you don't have enough bricks and mortar, you can't build a full house. You have to start cutting corners, making the house smaller. So the same thing happens in, in, in the human body. And for whatever reason, one of the first corners that gets cut is this purple bone in the middle third of our face called the maxilla. Uh, for whatever reason, it starts to shrink, likely because it's not necessary for the survival uh, and procreation of our species. You know, the, there's something called the biological effect in natural systems, which is when, uh, when an organism is, is stressed, uh, and it thinks it's not going to make it, it puts all of its energy into reproduction because even though that organism might not survive itself, there's a, it, it, it tries to kind of put all of its, its effort into the next generation. And so it kind of um, basically robs itself of, of its own potential to, to ensure the, the continuation of its, of its genes. It's called a biological effect. <clears throat> so this is what, what starts to happen in our bodies is, is we start to... Our, 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 uh, the maxilla starts to shrink and then other things start to shrink. We start to you know, shrink in height, uh, bone density starts to go down. Uh, just like in the, the cats, our physiology starts to change. Um, even our, uh, the, the pelvic openings goes from round to, to oval. And, <clears throat> but talking specifically about this maxilla bone in our, in, our, in our heads, almost every single bone in, in our skull attaches to this or touches this maxilla bone. And so when it starts to shrink, it literally pulls everything else you start to get that middle, that the middle third of the face starts to get uh, that characteristic indent we saw in, um, in those, those pictures of the, the second generation traditional peoples. And you start to get, you know, no room for your wisdom teeth, crowded, crooked teeth, same kinds of things. And again, just like in a house, we talked about when, even if you build a really nice house, if you don't have the materials to maintain it, your, it bought, the house starts to fall apart. And so the, you, you start to see the, the really common sense connection between d physiological degeneration, cavities, and then uh, physiological deformities. These are just a continuation of the same thing. And we actually know this. Like there's, there's very common uh, you know, phrases in, uh, or sayings that we have. You know, the, the mouth is the window to your health. Uh, never, look to, never look a gift horse in the mouth. Uh, which is which is a, a an old saying because the way that that farmers used to judge the health of an animal, particularly horses, is they would look into their mouth. Uh, that's also the same way you judge the age of an animal. You look look into their mouth to see how how much wear and tear on their teeth. <clears throat> and and the the reason you would you would the saying you never look into never look look a gift horse in the mouth. The reason they say that is because if somebody gives you a horse. It's a, you know, it's, it's a horse. It's, a, it's an incredibly valuable gift. Why would you want to look into its mouth to examine how good it is? It's, it's like 
you know, somebody giving you a, this, this beautiful um, uh, painting or something else like that. And you're like, oh, that's, that's, you know, I wonder how much this is worth, right? So that's that saying came is because we, we've, we've known traditionally that the mouth is the window into our health. And so uh, Dr. Weston A. Price and the folks at the Weston A. Price Foundation have found uh, correlations between, you know, straight teeth uh, and, and what that means for, for other uh, portions of our body and crooked teeth. So, you know, straight teeth, you've got lots of room there's, uh, in your head for your, for your glands, your pineal, pineal your hypothalamus. You've got good sc- uh, skeletal development, good muscles, keen eyesight and hearing, optimal function of the organs. Uh, you, you actually tend to have a really good outlook on life. And um, the, I mentioned this before, but there's actually a round pelvic opening um, for easy birthing. One of the, the common themes that, that came across in all the traditional cultures was the relative ease of childbirth. You know, there's stories about, you know, uh, a woman laying down next to her, a pregnant woman laying down next to her husband at night. And in the morning when the husband woke up, he was introduced to his new baby. He slept right through the childbirth because it was so easy and painless, which again, this is, this is not what we hear about um, our, uh, our, our history is that childbirth was incredibly dangerous and a lot of women died. And now those are stories from, you know, uh, modernized cultures, you know, the, the, the European, um, type nations. This is, this is not necessarily the case for, for traditional peoples. And we see that with, with crooked teeth, uh, there was a, uh, a complete inverse of, of all those problems. So I know you're probably thinking, well, this is very anecdotal, you know, that like, this is, you know, all these, these stories and, 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 and observations and looking at people's teeth. This is, this is, you know, old hat. We, we've got science now today that can, that can prove all this stuff. And it's just all wishy-washy. And, and so, you know, w- what about all those studies that have been done? Well, I just like to point out that um, for a long period of time, uh, the science said something completely different. You know, the, uh, this was a, a, um, an ad by the, the Lard Information Council in the, the early 1900s. You know, they're happy because they eat lard. Lard was a, and fats were a huge part of, of our culture. And so much so that during the war, um, uh, fats were actually used to make ammunition, explosives and things like that. And people had to be essentially threatened or coerced into uh, saving their fats, not eating them you know, fry your bacon and put it into a can and bring it to your meat dealer so that we can, you know, for the war effort. It was, it was a, a measure of austerity that, that, that um, you are sacrificing something of value to contribute to the greater good. Now, today, of course, you know, after almost 100 years of, of incredible propaganda by uh, some very insidious organizations, uh, this, you know, this is a, an advertisement by the World Health Federation uh, that is... Uh, making a comparison between butter and razor blades. This is another uh, ad where there's a lovely plate of cheese here on a table that's actually a mouse trap. You know, what's going to happen when you eat some of that cheese and all the fat that's associated with that? This is at the International Food Council just a few years ago, begging people, please don't switch out your vegetable oil for lard. It's almost like there's, there's a, uh, Something that they they people they they see the resurgence back to this, but they're they're begging people don't don't go back to it. Even things like Time Magazine, uh, over the course of just a few decades, you know there was there was all this information about how bad cholesterol is for us. But now, you know, years later, scientists labeled fat the enemy. Why were they wrong? You know, we're starting to see a, a change in in the story of science. And I'd also like to point out. A really simple analogy is uh, is what do all these things have in common? Things like Agent Orange, PCBs, DDT, glyphosate, aspartame, RBGH, and dioxin. All these things have at least two things in common. So the first thing is that they were all manufactured by the exact same company, a company known as Monsanto. Now uh, they've been bought up by uh, the European company uh, Bayer. But all of these, these, these chemicals were, were made by the same company. And the other interesting thing is that every single one of them was proven by science to be totally safe. It was advertised for years. Agent Orange was the defoliant that was used in the Vietnam War. 
PCBs were, were, were chemicals that were, were told were totally safe. DDT was a, a herbicide that was used again in the early 1900s, but what it was linked to the, the uh, deaths of, of falcons, particularly peregrine falcons and the thinning of their eggshells, it was banned. Aspartame, you know, it's, these are, uh, aspartame and glyphosate are, there's, there's still a little bit of, of hesitancy on that, but there's a, a, a gro huge amount of research showing the incredible dangers of, of aspartame, um, which is the artificial sweetener and glyphosate, which is a herbicide. I'll talk more about that later. RBGH, also known as uh, uh, bovine growth hormone, which was a chemical that's actually banned in Canada, but in, uh, in the United States, it's, it's basically a hormone that's injected into dairy cows to increase their milk production. And what it does is it basically tricks the, the cow's body into producing, uh, into thinking it has an infection in its mammary gland, so it increases production. The problem is that the milk basically has pus in it and uh, is very unhealthy. And there's uh, incredible amounts of research and scientists that were you know, lost their jobs or were blowing the whistle about the dangers of these things, but yet they're still used today. Same thing with dioxins. So <clears throat> uh, just taking one of these, for example, which is glyphosate, which is still, uh, even though the World Health Organization uh, states that glyphosate is a, is a you know, probable carcinogen, and it's been proven now in you know, several courts of law around the world where, where people, um, particularly there's a groundskeeper in the United States who developed, uh, I believe it was pancreatic cancer, um, and, as, and he proved in a court of law that he developed cancer as a result of working with glyphosate, even though it was told to be safe. There's ads that it was, you know, safe as basically drink it. It was biodegradable, all these different things. Science and these companies told us it was, it was totally safe. <clears throat> Yet, when you look at the, the um, patent numbers of this herbicide called glyphosate, we find that in 1960s, it, was, it wasn't a herbicide at all. It was actually a, a chelating agent. It was a, uh, a chemical that was flushed through pipes in factories to uh, basically descale, pull minerals away from the, the, the edge of the pipes um, and flush it out the other end. That was its original purpose. But somebody must have noticed that, you know, hey, when this stuff comes out the other side of the pipe, it kills all the plants on the other side. Maybe this could be used as a herbicide. And that's just what happened in 1968. It was patented. You can look all these numbers up yourself. There's a U.S. patent for uh, gr ground up uh, being used as a herbicide in the 1960s. Then in, in 2003, it was patented not only as an antimicrobial, something that kills microbes, but also as a biocide. A biocide, bio meaning life, side meaning kill, is literally means it kills all life. And we're told that this this chemical is safe enough to drink. It's biodegradable. <clears throat> and it, it is one of the most widely used chemicals in the world. Uh, uh, I believe person per, for every person on the planet today, uh, every year there are is about one kilogram of herbicide sprayed per person worldwide. And if you look at the, you know, the MSDS sheets for glyphosate, you know, consuming half a liter of this is, is considered a, a lethal dose. Uh, here in Alberta, Canada, uh, because we're an agricultural population and, and there's very few people that, that live, about, only about 5 million people, there's over 15 million kilograms of this herbicide that's sprayed every year in Alberta. The other interesting thing about glyphosate is that it's water soluble. It's incredibly persistent. The half-life of glyphosate is about 25 years. And when it breaks down, it doesn't become sick. When it, halfway through that in 25 years, it doesn't become safer. It becomes more dangerous. It's incredibly persistent. Uh, it is literally patented as uh, 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 something that binds minerals, kills plants, kills microbiology, and kills all life. And yet, it, according to the U.S. Uh, geological survey records, they're spraying it uh, almost hundreds of pounds per square kilometer or hundreds of pounds per, per acre every year <clears throat> um, for, for a huge portion of the United States. And, and again, because it's water soluble, it gets, it gets into the hydrological cycle. We're drinking it in, our, in our, our, our factories. And there's some excellent research that's been done by Dr. Uh, Zach Bush, who has shown that uh, since the, the widespread use of, of Roundup, 
the increasing use of Roundup, which is linked not only to things like celiac disease, um, but, uh, uh, but also to the, the incredible shift of, of cancer zones where uh, the cancers used to, used to all uh, used to congregate around um, you know, the, the more populated areas, uh, like along the coastlines, there's be a lot, a lot more cancers there. But now there's been a complete uh, reversal of the cancer um, uh, frequencies. And now they actually, they, they mimic the hydrological patterns of, of the United States. So the further you go downstream, the more there are cancers there are. It's, it's no longer associated with, with industry. It's associated with, with agriculture and watersheds. And of course, there's other factors that are that are interacting together. But by their own by their own admission, these are things that bind minerals, which are the building blocks of our bodies. They they kill plants, they kill microbiology, which again, the, there's a whole other level of, of our microbiome that's involved. And they also they're they're just deadly. They they and they've been proven to cause cancer in in the court of law. And so if folks uh, want to do some more you know, research into this, you'll find that a lot of the science that is thrown out there about how you know, dangerous animal foods are, they are either mistaken anecdotal observations, they are uh, limited term trials that you know, they'll, they'll study mice for a short period of time and say, oh, no, these, these foods are totally safe. Um, they'll take food components tested in isolation when they're, they're, they're typically used together. So they'll extract a singular component of you know, animal food that, you would, that is not natural and they'll feed that to a rat and it'll get sick. Or they'll, they'll even take food-like substances instead um, and test those or, or inject them into the bloodstream. It, you know, they'll you know, isolate a, a molecule from milk and instead of letting the, the, the mouse or the, the test subject consume it, they'll inject it into their bloodstream and it'll kill them or, or cause all these kinds of problems. So there's, there's all of this, this really fake science that's, that has been incredibly well documented, the cherry picking, the falsifying data by uh, none other than, than Sally Fallon in her incredible books, uh, Nourishing Diets, uh, um, uh, Nourishing Fats, Nourishing Bone Broth, uh, as well as her uh, incredible recipe book. Uh, she has many YouTube videos online. I was able to interview her uh, uh, a couple years ago about her newest book. It's available on my website, uh, cohenfarm.ca slash resources on my blog there. I've also got a link to some of her other incredible YouTube presentations you can watch on my website that go through. There's a, a really good one called The Oiling of America, which shows the incredible um, conspiracy between government and uh, industries to ram this belief that fats were bad for us down our throats. And so when we, when we look at all the science, we find that it's, it's, it's utter garbage. Um, you know, things like the China study and Ansel Keys and, and the, the food pyramids and things like that were really very uh, seditious and uh, manipulative uh, attempts that were sponsored by, you know, big industries to try to get us away from our traditional foods onto these modern foods that were highly processed, cheap to produce, stored for a long time, um, and uh, I believe uh, took away our food sovereignty from us. So another question you might be asked is, well, what about the food guides? You know, the, that's kind of the, the culmination of, of, of all the science. You know, it's not just, you know, an independent study here. It's, it's our very governments are publishing they're, they're looking at all the studies and saying, no, this is what you should eat to be, to be healthy. Well, what about, what about the food guides? So again, we, we see that the, the food guides have, uh, have not always uh, you know, reflected what they are today, which if you actually track the, the changes, you can see every year the portion of meat and, and dairy you know, decreases and the portion of vegetables and grains uh, um, and you know, processed foods increases. But at one point, we can see here that uh, uh, folks were told to eat liver, heart, or kidney once a week. This is Canada's official food, food rules. And then uh, fast forward a couple of years and we see that, uh, you know, a fresh liver oil is a source of vitamin D and should be given to children uh, and expectant women. Uh, Maybe advisable for um, other adults. We're told that we should, you know, consume uh, liver frequently. And then we fast forward to the 1960s and there's suddenly there's no mention of, of liver anymore. And every year 
that, um, or sorry, that, that's not true. In 1961, eat liver occasionally. So we went from eat liver frequently to eat, uh, or we went from eating liver, several liver, heart, and kidney uh, once a week to eating just liver frequently to eating it occasionally. And now there's no mention of, of organs on our food guides. And uh, we're told to stay away from saturated fats. You know, don't, there's no mention of, of, of bone broths even in any of these, these food guides here. So uh, what, what these food guides really amount to is a culmination of all of the propaganda and misinformation that has been put out by these, these uh, incredibly uh, massive corporations that have been designed to essentially turn humans into the very shape of the pyramid uh, itself. So <clears throat> we can see here, you know, the, the, um, the you know, wonderful correlation between, you know, the Kellogg's, the Cargill's, the Kraft's, the Tyson's, uh, and uh, of course our, you know, Coca-Cola's and, and processed sugar companies. So <clears throat> um, if you want one final piece of, of proof that our, uh, our governments do not have our own best interest in mind and that they're incredibly uh, subjective or um, influenceable by big industry, just months after, you know, the, the World Health Organization labeled uh, glyphosate as a probable carcinogen and there was proven in, in, in courts of law that glyphosate uh, was, was causing cancer in at least, you know, several cases. Um, uh, at the same time, you know, the, the, the Canadian government published their new food guide, which, you know, show, it doesn't say eat meat, it says eat protein foods. What's a protein food? Uh, make water your drink of choice. No longer any milk on the plate here. There's actually no dairy whatsoever. And, you know, look at the huge amount of vegetables on this, this plate. So <clears throat> what, what, uh, what we can see here is that uh, on the same, this, this around the same time that the, the Canada published this new food guide, they uh, also came out with uh, this wonderful article in the Western Producer uh, that says, you know, Health Canada says unbiased assessment, in quotations, clears glyphosate of, of any wrong, wrongdoing. So the same organization that's telling us what to eat is telling us that a, that a known carcinogen who's been patented to bind minerals that are essential, things like calcium, magnesium, manganese, that blocks those up, makes them unavailable, kills plants, kills microbiology, and kills all life, totally safe. So uh, you, if, as you start to dig into the, the history of the manipulation and the misinformation that has been uh, uh, we've been subjected to all around the world by our uh, governments in, in cooperation with, with huge businesses, you'll find that uh, um, suddenly these observations that were made in the 1930s were, were not so shocking or hard to believe after all. So what I find that's really interesting is that, you know, these, these traditional peoples had no dentists, no floss, no toothbrush, no healthcare. They didn't have less electricity a lot of times. Uh, they lived in, in some cases, literally mud huts or uh, you know, sawed roofs and things like that. And they had no health problems. You know, they're living to 80, 100 years old with, you know, almost zero tooth decay, let alone uh, all the other illnesses that, that, uh, that we're plagued by today. And yet today, you know, we've got 10 different kinds of floss, um, hundreds of different kinds of tooth. Like it's, there's aisles of just dental products. You can have extra soft, soft, hard, firm. There's toothbrushes that cost $100 or more. There's fluoride in the toothpaste, which incidentally is actually made by the same company, Procter & Gamble, that uh, was one of the major drivers in, in getting traditional saturated fats out of our diets, introducing vegetable fats. Well, that's a whole other story. We've got free healthcare here in Canada and most places in the world, and we've got all kinds of problems. And so uh, if, if somebody ever asks you the question, you know, why, why the long face? as you can see here in, in Keanu Reeves, who really kind of epitomizes the, the miserable, you know, depressed, uh, long-faced, crooked teeth, angsty, uh, uh, modern human in our culture. When somebody asks you why the long face, 
you can say, well, it's because our health and vitality has been stolen from us by the politically correct diet dictocrats. And I believe that's literally what's happened is we have been robbed of our birthright by corporations and corrupt governments. Okay, so that's the health piece is, is but are animal foods bad for us? Well, obviously they're not. Every traditional culture that's ever existed has always eaten them. They might not have eaten meat, but they always ate some kind of, of animal food, even if it was just insects or, or milk or something like that. So that's the first kind of myth out of the way. So that, that'll give you permission to, to return to these traditional foods. But the, of course, the other one is, well, but, but even if they're good for us, animals are bad for the planet. You know, they're bad for the environment. Look at all the factory farms that are, that are causing all the, the dead zones and the oceans and all these different things. Well, again, this is, this is a, a, another modern uh, problem. When we look back again at, at, at traditional ecosystems and traditional cultures, we find that, first of all, the way that we're raising animals in terms of agriculture is very different than, than a, you know, a few hundred years ago. But also, uh, if we look back farther uh, into you know, research that was done by Charles C. Mann in his book, 1491, uh, and uh, by Dan Flores, American Serengeti, we find that there was more animals in most parts of the world you know, hundreds of years ago than there are today. So th the, the idea that, that animals are bad for the environment is, is, is utterly uh, ridiculous. And um, we, we, can, we can very easily uh, uh, point this out by just thinking about what are the four ingredients of agriculture to, to produce any kind of agricultural product, whether it's food, fiber, pharmaceuticals, or fuel. Uh, there's only four of them, and it's sunlight, it's water, it's soil, and it's organisms, flora and fauna, plants and animals. And all of those ingredients, they basically, so the, 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 Flow looks like this. Sunlight comes down. It combines with with uh, you know water and and you know carbon. The plants produce. Uh, they they pull minerals out of the soil. They produce some kind of a, a leaf that harvests all that stuff. They, it grows really big, and and a human eats that plant or an animal eats that plant, and the whole thing gets better and 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 bigger and more productive over time. And so animals are obviously an essential part of ecosystems for for numerous uh, reasons, particularly for you know, the nutrient cycle and, re and recycling plants, uh, building the phosphorus levels. They're also uh, incredibly important for certain, certain plants can't actually live without, without animals, without spreading their seeds, helping them to germinate, um, things like that. So when we look at you know, modern industrial agriculture, which is, you can see, this is our farm uh, near Farintosh, Alberta, uh, on the left side here, this is a, a, an industrial farm that grows plants. So this, this farm only produces plants. This one produces mostly animals and, and, the, and the, the plants that those animals eat. Which one of these farms is healthier? And so when we fast forward, this picture was taken May 24th. Which one of them is harvesting more sunlight? Which one of them is harvesting more water? Which one of them has more biodiversity? Which one of them has more soil? If you can see the soil erosion in this picture, you can see the degraded riparian areas. You can see the loss of biodiversity. There's, you can see the lack of solar harvesting that's happening. Green leaves are required for photosynthesis. There's none happening here. Now we fast forward to June 17th, just a few days before the longest day of the year. Same picture. Our farm on the left, industrial plant farm on the right. I mean, almost the longest day of the year where you can harvest the most solar energy, these plants are barely out of the ground. They're not pulling carbon out of the air. Fast forward to uh, the end of August. We see, again, our farm still green. Uh, this is actually taken in, a, in one of the worst droughts in, in uh, uh, almost half a century in our county. Yet our farm is still green, still photosynthesizing. There's still animals out grazing around. You can see our dairy cows here in the pasture and our, our beef cows would be out somewhere else. Our pigs and chickens are on our integrated livestock system there. On the other side, that crop has, has already been baled. It's, it's, it's stopped harvesting. Once, once annual crops produce seed, they stop photosynthesizing. And they stop putting those, those four ingredients of agriculture into productive use. And so you can see right away that the observation that, that animals are bad for the environment is, is utterly ridiculous. Um, what, what it really comes down to is it's the how, not the cow. 
this is this is really important. I I am in in complete opposition to factory farming and degenerative livestock agriculture. Uh, they are incredibly bad for the anim, for the environment, and they're also incredibly bad for the animals. But to to make the blanket statement that all animals are bad and that cows are causing global warming is utterly ridiculous. There were there were almost as many uh, bison in North America as there are beef cattle today. And so you, you, you can't make these jobs in the same way that, that all traditional peoples always ate, they ate meat. There were more animals 200 years ago than there are now. Um, so it, there, there obviously has to be another factor here, which is, which is how the animals are being raised, not the animals themselves. This is a, this is a critical piece. And, and there's, there's an intimate connection between the nutrient density of our food and the health of the ecosystem that it was grown in. Because again, you know, the, the, the soil minerals, they can only get up into the plants if the soil is healthy and, and if there's a healthy water cycle. And, and all of those things feed back on each other to create more biodiversity, which increases the amount of nutrient density in the soil, which increases the nutrient density of the food, which in the grass, which increases the nutrient density of the meat, and all of these things spiral together. But because of our warped sense of our place in the world as being the top of the, the food, food, chair, food chain, <clears throat> we um, we're literally destroying our our planet and and ourselves in the process, and so we need to make a shift uh, in our in our paradigm about what our place is from ecological to ecological. And when we do that, we are going to have an increase in the nutrient density of our food. And so, just to go into this a little bit more uh, uh, in a little bit more detail. There's, in terms of why there's this nutri nutrient density lost, we can see there, there is very good evidence. West, Dr. Weston A. Price in the 1930s, he saw there was a you know, four to 10 times decrease in nutrient density. Dr. D.E. Thomas was comparing data from the 1940s. So after Dr. Weston A. Price, um, from 1940s to 1991, he found there was in some cases a 100% decrease in the amount of, of, of certain vitamins, or certain minerals. Um, and a decrease in, in almost all of our, all these essential minerals. Again, these are the building blocks of life. And so when we, when we look back at, you know, what's, what's causing that, we, we find that there's literally been a war on our soil, a war on our ecosystems, that you can see every, every decline in the nutrient density of our food corresponded to an increasing in the, the mechanization and the industrialization of, of modern agriculture. And this literally is a war. Uh, you know, our tanks have become tractors, our bombs, the nitrogen and potassium and, and phosphorus that is used to make ammunitions is, is now used to make fertilizer. Our mustard gas, uh, which were used at the beginning of the, at the end of the First World War, they turned into the precursors for our pesticides. Bayer, this in, uh, Bayer was, the, was a company that made the mustard gas and the, uh, the other gases that were used to exterminate um, the the Jewish people in the, in the concentration camps. These, now it's the company that, that produces our medicines to heal us and our pesticides and herbicides to, to grow our food for us. And of course, our atomic bombs at the end of the Second World War and our ability to manipulate uh, elements at the, at the molecular level, they turned into our genetically modified organisms, which uh, connects back to our glyphosate, which, which was... Um, uh, a lot of plants have been have been genetically engineered to resist glyphosate. So you can spray Roundup or glyphosate on things like soybeans, cotton, corn, uh, potatoes, things like that, and it won't kill those plants because they're they've been they've been altered molecularly to to be able to survive, and yet it'll kill everything else around it. And so what is that doing to the plant? The plant itself is being sprayed with with a chemical. Um, that is that is known to be toxic and bind minerals and and, and kill all life, um, but uh, and then we get into how glyphosate is also being used as a desiccant now. So as a po because farms are so big now, uh, it takes so long to harvest. Uh, typically, when we look back, say at this this picture here, you can see where all the swaths used to be. So this this used to be a field of of solid grain a swather comes by and, and cuts it all down and makes it into a swath or a windrow. And then a combine comes along and, and chews up that, combine, that, that swath or that windrow, threshes the grain from the straw, spits the straw at the other end, which you can then bale it, which is what they've done here. 
But <clears throat> because farms are so big now, farmers don't have time to do those two steps. They can't swath it, which helps the grain to dry down so the, th the threshing in the combine works properly. So what they do is they go through and they spray the crop while it's still standing. And what do they spray it with? They spray it with Roundup, with glyphosate, which kills the plant so that it can, it's dead and it's still standing so it dries faster and it saves time so the farmers can harvest them. It's called desiccation. This is a modern agricultural practice. Uh, luckily now, uh, because of the incredible evidence that this is, this is linked to all kinds of, of gut disorders, celiac disease, um, and, uh, and everything, everything else, there's now uh, talk of banning that practice. But since the 1990s, that was the norm. And if we look back at uh, this chart here, we can see the, the again, it's not, correlation is not necessarily causation, but there's, when, when we know what glyphosate does to our microbiome and that it is, it is an antimicrobial, what's happening in, with, with a celiac disease? It's, it's, a, it's a gastrointestinal disorder. So of course there, there has to be some kind of a connection there. It might not be the, the only factor, but it certainly plays a role. And so you can see that, that the, the, the nutrient density of our food is directly related to the health of our ecosystems and, and our current plant-based agricultural system, which it, whether these plants are grown to be fed to animals in, in barns or grown to be fed humans, which are in barns or cities, it's the same thing. It's not a healthy ecosystem. It's, it's again, it's, it's the how, not the cow. These animals shouldn't be fed grain in a barn. They should be fed grass and natural in their natural diets out in a healthy environment like this, where their nutrients can go directly back onto the ground, which produces more grass and healthier grass every single year. So, um, of course, it's it's uh, with with a little bit more of a careful look. It's clear to see that uh, animals are not bad for the environment. They're essential for the environment, and they're essential for the healing of the environment as well. Okay, now the third myth, which is that it's unethical to kill animals. It's immoral. Now, <clears throat> I'd like to. Uh, just read one of the quotes from one of my favorite authors, uh, Mr. Wendell Berry, which is that to live, we must daily break the body and shed the blood of creation. And we do this knowingly, lovingly, skillfully, reverently. It is a sacrament. And when we do it ignorantly, greedily, clumsily, and destructively, it is a desecration. So I believe that all life is sacred, whether it is a plant or an animal. And, and that regardless of, of, uh, of what we eat, it is important to uh, eat it skillfully, lovingly, lovingly and, and reverently. And so I, again, I am in complete opposition to factory farming and suffering of, of the needless suffering of animals. But I'm also against the factory farming of, of plants and the needless suffering of, of those. And you might say, well, there's, there's a difference between, you know, you know, plants and animals and, and you know, one of them is conscious and one of them isn't. And, and this is something that's, that is very, very, up until recently was was kind of a cut and dried thing but now uh, because of studies that are being done um, that you can look up in terms of a book called the secret life of trees or uh, documentaries like smarty plants or the secret life of plants we start to see that through various experiments plants have the ability to make decisions they have the ability to uh, have memory they have the ability to show uh, preferential treatment towards their own young. They have the ability to um, share uh, nutrients um, communally, and, and which is almost a, a, the idea of, of kind of planning ahead. And they, they, um, they're also showing signs of being able to make decisions. And that, that um, I, I won't go through all the, the experiments there and, and how they're, they're proving these things. But for me, all of those those aspects show signs of, of consciousness. And without getting too much into the details, if, if you, again, if you ask these traditional cultures, uh, uh, you know, what the, whether or not plants were alive, they would laugh at you. Of course they're alive. Of course they, the, the you know, the, the, the shamanistic cultures of, of indigenous peoples all around the world saw plants and animals as our teachers and as our guides 
and uh, they were both incredibly important for our 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 diets as well as our, our spiritual lives. And so I believe that when we, if we eat well, for, take for example this picture here. This is how we harvest our animals on our farm. There's no feedlots. There's no there's no stress. There's no there's no. Uh, um, you know, a lot of farmers say, you know, my animals only have one bad day, and that's the day that they get shipped off farm to the the factory, uh, the the slaughter farm. Our animals don't have a single bad day. Every single day they wake up from, from they're born on our farms and they, and they are harvested on our farms and is done in a lovingly, skillfully, reverently, um, uh, sacred manner. And, uh, and, and when it is done that, I believe there is no argument that it is, it is unethical to eat animals. Life requires death to feed it. And just as, as, as Wendell Berry says here, when, when we do that with, with, the, with good intentions um, and with, with, with skill, um, it is, it is a, a, a testament, it is a tribute to, to life. It is, it is not the opposite. And so uh, the, it's not what you eat, it's how you eat it. And, uh, and that's the distinction here. Now, the, of course, the, the, the reason, another reason why animals, organs, bones, and fats are so important is because almost 50% of most animals that we eat are organs, bones, and fats. And if you're not eating that, then that animal is dying uh, um, a life that, that, that isn't being appreciated. Half of it's going to waste. So most of the nutrients are in the organs, and organs, bones, and fats. And those are the things that we're told to throw away. And I think that's very, very disrespectful uh, for an animal that is that's giving its life so that we can live. So right there, we just uh, unpacked those three myths that animals are bad for our health, animals are bad for the environment, and that animals are, uh, it's uneth unethical to eat animals. And I believe I've, I've done uh, a reasonably good job of, of giving you guys permission to start eating some of these foods that uh, you've probably wanted to all along, um, but uh, you felt guilty about eating them. So now, I want to go through some of the skills, really basic stuff about how you can start incorporating organs, bones, and fats back into your life, learning some of these traditionals because it's, it's really not that complicated. And then we're going to finish off with my three favorite recipes uh, so that you can, you can start making some of these, these things in your own homes. Okay, we're starting off with organs. First off, um, you already eat organs. Muscle meats are organs. The skin is an organ. Gizzards, heart, liver, kidney, tongue, blood, tripe, thymus. Every, every part of an animal is an organ, technically. And what's interesting is that every single one of these organs has different nutrients in it. Of course it does, because it does different things in the body. And so <clears throat> the, what's important is, um, is that you're eating a diversity of these organs, not just the muscle meats. And interestingly enough, a lot of these traditional cultures, they... Uh, the muscle meats were the, the, the waste product. They were fed to the dogs. It was, they were, it was starvation food. The, the very first thing, uh, you know, the, the Plains Indians uh, or the Plains, Plains Indigenous people um, in North America here would do when they, when they killed the buffalo is they would cut out its liver and they would squirt the gallbladder on the liver and eat it raw. Um, the, the buffalo hunters that massacred the huge herds of, 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 uh, of bison in the, the 1800s, uh, sometimes they, were, they would only take the tongue from the, the animal, and they, that was the most valuable part. They would, they would shoot a 2,000-pound animal and take a two-pound cut and let the rest to rot. So the muscle meats, which is what we're told to eat, they're super high in protein. They don't have a lot of fat, they're, and they're, they're imbalanced. They, they're, they're not uh, a full nutrient profile. And so it's really important when you're eating an animal to try to eat the, as much of the animal as possible because they all have different parts in it. and and traditionally the um the the part of the animal you're eating was associated with the nutrients that were needed for that part of you and so a lot of the sacred foods that were fed to people at different stages of, of their life corresponded to the needs of their of their own organs at those ages so if you were a, a woman who's was uh um 
uh, was lactating um, and, and you would eat you know, the mammary glands. If you were a male and you wanted to be very fertile, you, eat the, you would eat the testicles and the genitalia of the, of, of the male animals. If you were a female, you would eat the female genitalia. If you had lung problems, you'd eat the lungs of the animal. If you, had, if you wanted to be smart, you'd eat the brain because it's almost entirely made of fat. <clears throat> and so you can start to use those um, very basic observations to uh, uh, start to uh, incorporate more kinds of organs into your life. Now, of course, again, there's, there's a huge difference between the quality of the organs. You can see in these pictures here, you know, only one of these looks healthy enough to eat. And that is, you know, the, the pasture raised organic. Just because something's organic and it's raised in a barn doesn't mean it's healthy. You want an animal that was raised outside in a natural environment who is able to express its full, um, its full animal animalness, and whatever that looks like, uh, and you obviously want to avoid the poor quality uh, organs from either unhealthy animals or animals that were raised in a in a uh, industrial way. Coming back to the the nutrient density of different organs, the you might think, well, there's you know there's there's uh, you know in a two thousand pound cow or a, uh, even say a thousand pound cow is more, more typical, you, you know, the organ might only be 10 pounds. And so, you know, that, that seems like it's, it's, you know, way out of proportion. Yes. But, you know, when you look at things like the B12 uh, that's found in beef liver, you know, there's, there's over 3000% of the recommended daily intake for, um, for vitamin B12. And so we can see that, <clears throat> you know, if you have a hundred grams of, of beef liver, that's enough vitamin B12 for a month. You don't need it very often. Um, and, uh, you know, same thing with, you know, other ribo riboflavins and other, other B vitamins. Um, copper it was, was very high in, uh, in, in liver. So is vitamin A. And when we look at the pork kidney or something like that, we see that it's, it's again, really high in selenium and other things. Every part of the animal has different nutrients in it, different vitamins, different minerals that are used in our own bodies for different functions as well. So you wanna have a diversity of, um, of, of organs, and you don't need to have a whole lot of them. Just, you know, every, every couple months can be enough. So now, of course you think, well, yeah, but I've tried to eat liver, I've tried to eat, you know, tripe. How do you make it taste good? They're just, they're, they're awful. And I believe part of the reason why they, they, they don't taste very good is, be, is because they're so high in vitamins and minerals. So, you know, that, that metallic -y taste, if you eat liver that isn't, isn't cooked properly, you know, that's, that's the iron, that's the vitamin A, that's the, the copper. It's, it tastes like you're eating a piece of tin. So the, the way that you, um, you hide that, or I don't even think it's, it's not even a matter of hiding it, it's the way that you, you uh, partner with that is by making sure that you've got enough fat, um, you, you try to mask the texture, and you use the correct spices. Those are the three things you need to think about when you're trying to, if you want to make organs taste good. Uh, the fat um, is partly to, uh, I believe the, the reason why it's so intense and it's kind of, it's, it's off-putting or it's very strong is if you, if you cut it down with fat, like for example, the liver pate recipe that I have in my recipe book here, uh, it's, it's like there's almost, a, almost two pounds of, of uh, or sorry, there's almost 50% of the recipe is, um, is fat and the rest is liver. Uh, and so when you eat it, it's, it's delicious. There's nobody you could feed it to that wouldn't want it. But if you just eat a piece of raw liver, you know, maybe if you're, uh, uh, your taste buds have been adapted to that. But the other thing that, that the, it's important is the texture. And so by, by grinding it up, by chopping it, by frying it, um, you can mask the kind of mushy or the, the chunky texture that a lot of organs have that can be unsavory to, to people. And of course, spices. Um, you know, for me, mustard is something that uh, fermented mustard, particularly, um, totally masks um, the the flavor of of liver. Even if it was raw liver, if you put put a little bit of mustard on it, it it there's some reaction that happens there. Maybe it's the enzymes. I don't know, but my body just loves it when I get the when there's the correct amount of fat. There's the I get the texture right and the the spices all together. It's fantastic, and so. One of the simple recipes in the recipe book here is something I call uh, the, the organs, um, ground organ stir fry, which is you can turn it into patties or you can just you actually just make it a stir fry, add to other things. 
But essentially what it is, is uh, there's uh, about 10 to 15% organs that, I, gr that I, I like to grind or chop up. So liver, kidney, heart, lung, basically whatever you can get, chop it up really, really fine, grind it up if you have a grinder and, uh, and put about 10 to 15%, mix that in with, the, with some other kind of ground meat, whether it's pork or beef, and, and then throw in you know, the, the, the spices and, uh, and some onions, maybe even some bone broth in there and mix it up and fry. It is delicious. I've done uh, almost a dozen samples where I'll take the exact same mix. The only thing that's different is one has organs and one doesn't. I cook it the same way. I just add the organs in at the very end. And I'll put these two things side by side and I'll ask people, which one do you like more? And they'll, everybody says they like the one with organs more, even though they don't, they don't know. There's something about it. It just it has a richer flavor. It just feels better. It just really, you know, energizing. And, and, and everybody agrees that the one with organs, they don't know why, because they don't know if there's organs in it, but they like that one better. And so the, the berries you can see there are, are also that, that I find is a really nice um, kind of a spice or a flavor to, to mix in there along with, you know, the thyme, the salt, and the pepper, whatever spice flavors you like to help um, uh, augment and, uh, uh, and kind of balance out some of those, uh, those flavors. Things like nutmeg, cloves, really play around with it. When you find the spice mix and the textures that work for you, there's almost no organ you can't eat. It's really quite exciting. Okay, so now for bones. What's, what's the, the secret for, for bones? <clears throat> well, to make bone broth, you, at a minimum, you need bones, water, you need heat. That's all you need. And if you really want to get fancy, you can add some vinegar, which helps to, to bring the, the alkaline minerals out of the bones into the bone broth because uh, they're trying to find an equilibrium. You can add herbs, you can add vegetables. Now, I myself, personally, um, I typically only do bones, water, heat, and, and vinegar. Uh, I don't add herbs or vegetables. I, the taste doesn't sit well with me. Uh, but you can play around with it, experiment. And, and the, the trick is that you want to take your bones in whatever size pot you've got, doesn't matter, Pack the bones in as tightly as you can get it um, so there's no spaces and add water and cover the bones. Again, no matter what size pot you have, you don't need to measure anything. Just pack the bones in. Uh, obviously, you don't want the, the bones to be right to the, the top of the pot um, because you want to have uh, at least one or two inches of water above the bones and you want to cook it low and slow for, you know, four to 24 hours and just taste it as you go along and you feel your body will tell you when it's, uh, it's the right mix. And, and, um, and it, you'll find that, that changes. You know, I started out with, um, uh, you know, very long bone broths because that's what I liked. But now I typically go for about a 12 hour bone broth. I turn it on at night and the next morning I turn it off and I process it. And what that processing looks like from start to finish, this is a pig head, which you might think is, Oh my God, that's disgusting. But, uh, this is by far the most valuable part of a pig is absolutely delicious. You see the, the nose, the, the, the skin, the ear, it's full of cartilage, gelatin, um, uh, all these amino acids, um, glycine, calcium that, that are all part of, of, you know, healing your gut, helping with digestion, um, helping to your body to, to detoxify all these different things are all found in, 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 um, in a pig head. It's one of the only, parts of, a, apart from like a chicken foot where it has everything in it. Other bones, they, they typically have something like, they only have marrow or they only have this or that. The pig head has, has, has everything. And so what I do, again, you take a pot and you just, just cover the, the bones with, with, uh, with water. In this case, the heads were frozen. And so once they're cooked a little bit, they settle down. I did add herbs to this particular one. Lovage is a really nice herb that grows very nicely in, uh, in most climates. Um, you cook it until uh, typically until the water kind of just reaches the, the edge of the bones. Again, low and slow, you don't want like a rolling boil, even in a crock pot, if you're gonna, which you can use, you wanna keep the lid cracked so that, that it doesn't, doesn't get too hot because that can start to, uh, if, if meat gets too hot, it actually changes the, the chemical structure of them and they can turn carcinogenic. That's why you're not supposed to eat charred or, uh, charred or blackened meat. And so then what I do is uh, a lot of people strain it or they get spoons or they do all, all this messy stuff. 
none of that. Get your hands out, get your hands into the pot. Once, as soon as the, the temperature of the bone broth is, is down, uh, cool enough that you can get your hands in there and, and not burn them. Um, well, so it's still safe. It hasn't had, you know, long time to stick, stick in the danger zone and just reach in there, squish everything up, mush the stuff around. If there's any hair or anything that was on the pig's, pig's face, pull that off, find all those bones, put them out on a platter, save those bones. You don't want to, uh, we're going to get back to those later and then uh, make sure everything is squished up and then you've got your bone broth and you can do whatever you want with it. Now, if, if you're not cooking the bones that long, the meat might not fall apart and you might just have a, like a meat stock. That's totally fine too. But um, I highly recommend getting your hands and then you'll find more of the bones that, that get all mixed up. Um, and uh, you'll also be able to squish up all the chunks of fat and cartilage and stuff with your hands. It's a great moisturizer for your hand. This is why your, your uh, you know, great grandmother had such, had such great skin because she was constantly, you know, digging through the turkey and, and uh, the bone broth to get all those bones out. It's, uh, it's free moisturizer. <clears throat> now, with these bones, what you can do is you can burn them, you can compost them. Um, um, if you cook, you can also cook them again, and you'll get different nutrients out of them uh, the, the, the more times you cook them. And eventually, they'll literally just turn into, into dust or mush that you could actually consume. Some cultures did that. They actually they cooked the bones, they ate the ashes to get more minerals and those building blocks of life into their diet. So when it comes to the recipe uh, in, this, in my cookbook, I, uh, one of my favorites is something I call bone broth poutine or bone broth gravy, which is essentially you make a, a roux with, um, with flour and fat. Um, and it's really important that, you, that it's pure fat and, and, and uh, with no other liquid in it while you're browning your flour and typically in a frying pan, you don't want any, any other moisture in there or any other liquid. Once you get your flour nice and brown, I like to add in bone broth, you know, a cup or two, depending on how much gravy you're making. And that it turns into the thickest, richest, most luxurious gravy. One woman at, uh, at one of my workshops where I actually sampled all these different things, she told me, my God, this, this gravy is so good. You could put it on a tire and it would, it would taste delicious. Um, this has been a game changer for me for all of my, um, my meats and, and particularly for lean meat. So something like grass-fed beef, which tends to be you know, a little on the dry side and it's, it's, um, if it's not cooked just perfectly, it's just it's not that enjoyable to eat. If you make a gravy with that, with the drippings from the... the the beef roast and a little bit of bone broth and some nice herbs and spices. The beef roast tra transfer again when you when you get the or the organs, the muscle meats is an organ. You get the right amount of fat with it, which comes in the gravy in terms of the the lard or the butter that you're using, as well as the bone broth. Something magical happens, and um, and you stop wanting to put ketchup on everything and and sauces on everything um, that uh, that are that are highly processed. The, the, you make a gravy from the juices of whatever you just cooked. And, uh, and you know, in this picture here, I've got several different images. These are all, all foods that are produced on the farm. Our, our cheeses, our potatoes, our vegetables, our meat, our gravy, our fermented um, uh, veggies there, um, our, our creme fraiche. These are all things that, that, we, that we produce on the farm. And, and these are um, incredibly delicious meals that are they're gourmet, but they're very easy to make. I'm not a chef. I taught myself how to do all these things just through trial and error. Um, and uh, um, and I, I made everything in these, these pictures here. It's very, very easy. Okay, the final recipe I want to share with you guys is how to render fat. So whether this is beef tallow uh, or, or pig lard or poultry fat or duck fat or whatever it is, super simple. You need fat, you need heat. And uh, those are the, the two minimum things. And you also need, you, you can use salt uh, more as a, as a preservative later on. But to start off with, uh, I like to take my fat and I like to ch chop it up into little pieces. And then I typically put it in a crock pot or uh, something that I can do low and slow again. You don't want to get too hot because if it starts to smoke, it means that you've gone past the, the smoke point and it's becoming carcinogenic. It's not healthy for you anymore. So you want to put, put it on low heat. And at a certain point, the, the lard literally separate out from the uh, kind of the cellulose structure of the fat or the, the cracklings is what they're called. And then you can drain that out 
and you know store your lard into whatever jars you want. And this is where, I, if, if you want to store it at room temperature, you can mix in salt as it's cooling and kind of whip it up. It'll act as a preservative. You can also freeze these jars and they'll keep for uh, months in, the, in, in your freezer. But then the best part is you put those, uh, these little cracklings back into a pan and you fry them up until they get nice and crispy. You put some salts and, and spices on there and uh, now you've got lard that can be used to make gravy. It can be used to fry things in. Um, pork lard is, is, is just fantastic. It, it's a complete replacement for coconut oil in, in a cold climate like ours. It's almost the same uh, you know, chemical make. A pig is basically just a hairy uh, uh, coconut with legs. And, um, uh, and you know, this, this was you know, the amount of, of uh, this is kidney fat or, or leaf, uh, it's the fat around the organs, the most nutrient dense fat on, on an animal. And this would be the amount of fat you would get off of uh, half of a pig would be in this, in this little jar here. And, uh, you know, for one person, that is enough fat for half of a year, uh, if not longer, depending on how much you're, you're using it. So those are some really three of my, my favorite recipes. You can find them in, in the recipe book here um, that uh, uh, should have came with this, this, uh, this video that you're watching right now. If not, you can go to my website, colonfarm.ca, and you can sign up to a newsletter and you'll get a free download uh, as well. And there's uh, um, 18 recipes in, in this recipe book. There's also a page that has the, uh, a, a little bit of a write-up about Weston A. Price. It has a list of all those 11 principles if you want to start to follow those in your, in your daily life, uh, in your own diet. And the, the book is broken up into uh, sections about organs, bones, and fats. So things like liver pate, how to make, um, how to make roasts properly, how to make raw liver pills, how to make pork skin puffs, how to dry salt your meat, how to make bone broth, how to make bone broth soup, um, all these different things, um, as well as some, some excellent breakfasts and dessert dishes that are, are in this little recipe book as well. Uh, and I encourage you that these are, these are three of my favorites, but, you, but they all build off of each other. And you can, you can uh, really uh, simply and quickly learn these skills and incorporate this into your, your daily diet. So to finish off with, I want to uh, end on a, a really hopeful note. I know we've talked about a lot of, you know, for almost over a hundred years, we've been lied to about the foods that we should be eating. That's caused untold suffering and death in, in our culture. And so the question is, can this physiological degeneration be reversed? And the answer is absolutely. If you do research into the Weston A. Price Foundation, you'll find that parents that had terrible teeth problems, you know, braces and things like that, when if they make a shift to um, these traditional principles of, of healthy diets, um, you know, at least several months before, before conception, let alone um, uh, birth, um, the, the, the babies, and for both the man and the woman, um, because the, 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 the man might not be growing the baby, but he's all, he is uh, contributing to, um, to the growth of, of, a, of a new baby. And the, when you make those sh shifts soon enough, your, your, your body can stock up on those vitamins and minerals so that when you create the new body, in, in, uh, inside of you, uh, those babies can be healthy and, and they can re totally reverse the, the, the generation in a, single, in a single generation, which is absolutely fantastic. And the same thing with, with, with uh, uh, the, the cavities and things like that. I've healed cavities in my, I used to have to horrible uh, teeth problems. I've seen cavities of myself disappear. Dr. Weston A. Price had a protocol where he used cod liver oil and, and grass-fed butter and his 11 principles to uh, uh, heal, I believe there's one girl who had over 60 cavities in her mouth and within a few months they were gone just by following these. Our bodies have the ability to heal themselves, which is, which is really exciting. And the other piece I want to finish off on is, is what about the e ecological degeneration that we're seeing all around the world right now? Uh, you know, the loss of soil life, the, the biodiversity loss, all these different things. Can that be reversed? And the answer is of course. And it's, this is an uh, incredibly simple observation uh, to or point to prove in that um, uh, there's one of the most common pieces of, of literature that's being quoted these days is uh, an article in 2015 by the Science Advances uh, Scientific Journal 
uh, which was looking into the, you know, is Earth in its sixth mass, ex mass extinction event? So <clears throat> basically, there's, uh, there's a lot of evidence that's showing that, you know, insect life, mammalian life, all life on this planet is, is dying off. So we're losing species at an incredible rate. But of course, that's a natural process. You know, organisms are always dying and going extinct because the planet is constantly changing. But, but what they found is that those rates were, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of times above <clears throat> the normal levels of, of extinction rates. And so what the, this article concluded is that, yes, Earth is in its sixth mass extinction event right now, which is terrifying. And that's directly related to the way we are feeding ourselves on the planet, as we looked at before in those, those pictures. But this is a, this, the story from Science Advances, the study is, is, is incredibly hopeful for two reasons. The first is that, well, the 50% the or more of the planet species have gone, been exterminated in a mass event at least five times before, whether by an asteroid or a supervolcano or a pole reversal or a coronal mass ejection. At, at, at some points, if you look back at the, you know, the, the different mass extinction events in history, up to 90% of the organisms on the planet were wiped out in one fell swoop, sometimes in, in you know, a single day. And so, <clears throat> but what's interesting is that, you know, at least five times before, more than half the species in the planet were wiped out, and yet it's come back at least five times. And if you look back at the fossil record, every time life becomes more complex, as what, at one point humans didn't exist, which I, not, humans are not, not necessarily so special, but we are certainly a, a complex and, um, and an evolved form of life can, can, you know, compared to a single cell organism. And so the, not only does, do, is life anti-fragile to these disturbances, but it actually gets better. It thrives, it thrives in them. It, 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 can, it can be taken back to the, the brink of extinction and, and, and just get better. And the, the second reason why that study is, is incredibly, incredibly uh, important is that unlike the past five extinction events, which were caused by massive you know, impacts or, or, you know, uh, basically death rays from the sun or uh, in the, the north and south pole reversing and, and you know, collapsing the, the electromagnetic protection from the, from, uh, uh, the other cosmic impacts or, or volcanoes blackening out the, the sun for, for, for hundreds of years. This time, the thing that's causing the, the sixth mass extinction is us. It's humans. We are as powerful as asteroids, as the sun, as super volcanoes. And so when we ask ourselves, you know, what would it be like if we took that power and we stopped using it to fight with the natural world, to, to try to control it and bend it to our will, and instead we use it to partner with it, to improve the biodiversity, to improve soil health, to improve the water cycle, what would happen to the nutrient density of our food? What would happen to the, the well-being of, of all life around us? And so if we can go head to head with, with one of the most powerful forces in the known universe, because at a certain point, planet Earth didn't even exist. At a certain point, we were just stardust. The planet was just stardust. And it got coalesced because of the gravitational pull of our sun. And after billions of years, it cooled enough so that you know, bacteria that came in uh, from other space dust was able to land on it and slowly evolve over billions of years to the point where we are here today. And, and every, every couple hundred thousand years, it got knocked back to almost square one again, and it just kept mounting on. There's some force in the universe that wants to get better. It wants to grow and improve on itself. And we are going head to head with that force, and we are winning right now because of, of how powerful we are. What could it be like if we partnered with that force? And so I believe that we are literally eating ourselves and our planet to death. And the most powerful thing we can do is to start eating the change we want to see in the world. There's nothing that has, uh, that, that every single person on this planet does it. And if we all made the shift to moving towards more nutrient dense foods that were produced on regenerative farms, uh, that were where the animals and, and the plants were raised ethically, uh, we could 
completely transform our planet uh, in a very short time in the same way that we can, and we could also transform our health. And so there's this interesting connection that in order to heal ourselves, if, if we want to be healthy, we can't just keep popping vitamins and hoping these problems are going to go, go away because they won't, there, there'll be something else that'll stop. So in order to heal ourselves, we need to heal the planet, but also in order to heal the planet, we need to heal ourselves because the healthier we are, the better we can be stewards of this planet. And so I believe that organs, bones, and fats, because they've been so demonized um, and, and most people are so terrified to, to use them, uh, I believe they are a critical part of this regenerative agriculture and regenerative health movement that's happening right now. And, um, and I hope that what I've shared with you today is going to help empower you with the permission and the skills and some basic recipes so that you can take this information and start using it in your own life to help heal yourself and heal the planet. And I'll, I'll end on the, the final word from Dr. West, Nate Price himself. These were uh, his dying words when somebody asked him, you know, what, what do we do? There's just so much um, misinformation. and There's so much uh, just garbage science out there in the world. What do we do? How do we, how do we fight this, um, uh, this battle that we're in right now? And he said, you teach, you teach, you teach. Because if you found something valuable, in the, the message that I've shared here today. If you find a recipe that you enjoy in my book, uh, if you go on to the Weston A. Price website or my website and you find a resource that, it, that inspires you, share with others, educate yourself. We all need to become teachers in this movement. And, and by eating and by teaching, we will turn this thing around. So I hope you enjoyed the presentation and we'll talk to you later. Take care.